What has been their biggest discovery that any kind of astrophysicists have found? Uh, there's been a huge, it's hard to know where to begin with. It depends on which field you're talking about. But I think some of the most newsworthy things people have been talking about have been the discovery of these galaxies and black holes in the very, very earliest points in the universe. So JWST is like a time machine, as we kind of already alluded to. You're looking at light which has traveled for billions of years to reach your eye. Mm -hmm. And so some of that light is 13.7 billion years old. Now that means you are seeing a galaxy at the earliest point in the universe. Now we didn't think that galaxies should be around 100 million years after the Big Bang. That seems too soon, right? Because it takes a certain amount of time to build stars, for those stars to collect together to form galaxies, and then they have to swirl around, and you have to form this disk, and then you have to have the black hole in the center, and there's a lot of structure there. It takes time to build that. But we are discovering galaxies in these images that JBC are capturing. They sort of shocked us because we just didn't expect these things to form as fast as they did. And similarly, there's detection of black holes, which are very massive objects as well. That takes time to build a black hole, right? You can't just have one star collapse and make a giant black hole. The biggest black hole you can make that way is probably like 10 times the mass of the sun. But we are seeing black holes that are millions of times the mass of the sun. So the only way those could form is the combination of stars coming together smashing together and forming by coalescence these giant black holes. And we're seeing those in these images as well through quasars. So those are, those are challenging us. We're trying, trying to figure out, like, did we screw something up in the theory? Is there some new processes we don't understand? And I think that has been, you know, that's what good science is. It's, it's like challenging existing theory and proving that maybe there's something else out there we haven't thought of. Got it. So, and you guys are going when you said what month? Next, uh, October. So October we're coming so up pretty two soon. Gonna, are you excited about it? Is I'm it like so exhilarating cool. or? It's pretty wild, right? Because I'm going to look up into the sky. This thing's actually not in even orbit of the Earth. Where is it based at? It's, it's orbiting the sun. No, no. Where is the actual telescope at? There? Yeah, it's orbiting the sun. It co orbits the sun along with the Earth. So there is a position. It's kind of imagine the sun and then the Earth. And then behind the Earth, there's a gravitational well. Called, so it's in space. It's in space, called L2, Lagrange point two, and it, it lives in this little gravitational well. It's about four times further away than the moon is. It's, so this is four times? Yeah. <laughs> That's so, why it was expensive. So, That's why they <laughs> takes $10 billion to do Who paid for it? Who, who funded it? Uh, it was mostly funded by the U.S. taxpayer. Yeah. So we funded it. Yeah. But okay. the ESA contributed as well, and the Canadian Space Agency contributed as well. But it was pr primarily NASA. Mostly from NASA. Yeah. Okay. And so where do you go to be able to use it? You have to go anywhere. You just write a, you just tell them what you want to do. You write a program, you write a proposal, and then you work they with the engineers. They give you the findings? They give you the data. So the way it works for us is you get to ask, how long do you want to hold on to the data privately for? The maximum is one year. Because it's U.S. taxpayer money, so you can't hold on to forever. So we said, okay, we'll take the full year. We're going to have the data just for ourselves for one year. Then after that year, it becomes what global. Everyone can access that same data point after, after that point. Um, but during that year, we're obviously kind of in a time crunch to try and analyze the data and get it out to everyone. Does, he have, does, does, the, does the telescope have any form of AI where it's individually learning and getting smarter or no, it needs to be, yes. oh, okay. it needs so to be influenced control. to be able to seek? Yeah. Why didn't they create a self-learning technology as a telescope that's constantly working yeah. every second of the day? I, you know, there are some telescopes which are trying to figure out how to use smart scheduling like this. Um, there are some telescopes which are called survey telescopes where they basically do one thing, but they do it over and over again. And they just take an image of the sky, then they shift and another image of the sky and they shift. And then you want to do that in a very clever way. So that's where AI is coming in. You can use AI to optimize how you tile the sky and deal with, you know, maybe Jupiter's in the way on July 5th. So you don't want to point at that region of the sky when Jupiter's photobombing your image. So you need to account for all these different variables. And that's where smart scheduling comes in. But for JWST, it's, it's not that type of telescope. It's not a survey telescope. Yeah, Rubin's a good example of a survey telescope. JWST is not a survey telescope. It's one where human beings write in ideas and it's supposed to be for the most innovative and fresh perspectives that humanity has to offer. So, so is it like chat GBT for astronomers and astrophysics that you have to ask for it to give you the information and get it for go get it for you? Or is it more like Google? Hey, what is this? Let me go get it. Uh, to, to, to put it in context where the average person understands yeah. it, how, how does it, like, even when you want the request, right, here's what we want the findings to be. How long does it take to get it to you? Is it overnight? Is it one day? Is it a month? 
It would take a few days. I mean, the, the whole process from start to finish, let's go through it quickly, is, you know, there's this call for proposals, astronomers all around the world, and everyone else can write proposals to say, Look, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. So we put in our proposals, I think it's three or four pages of text, and you say, here's what I want to do, JWST is the best thing to do it, and we're sure we can do it. So this is your, it's like a business plan, you know, your business plan for the telescope. So you put that in, and then it goes to a committee of astronomers who rank these proposals. And I think last year, there was somewhere between 10 and 20 times more observing proposals than there was available time on the telescope. So they couldn't give everybody the time. They had to cut it down by about a factor of 10, what people asked for. So they only you know, take the, the top 10% best ideas, which are ranked by human beings, no AI involved. And then those best ideas are eventually scheduled onto the telescope. And again, that's the engineers who work at Space Telescope Institute, John Hopkins University, uh, down there in Baltimore. And those guys then help you schedule these observations. They collect the data. As soon as they collect it, the, you know, they have to transmit the data back to Earth, has to get some preliminary analysis by, by Space Telescope Institute, some calibration, and then it comes to my computer. And then we've got a year to publish to, it. To do whatever it's all humans. It's all humans. Okay, that's interesting that, that we don't... That is so weird to me that we are in this uh, uh, season of technology, of being able to make videos with your face and your audio mm -hmm. and your voice. And it's such so much technology that self-learning continuously getting smarter and smarter and smarter that this is waiting for us to feed it to get smarter. So maybe when did they start building this? How long ago was it when they started? You said 16 years ago? Uh, more than, probably 20, over 20 years ago. Over 20 years ago. Yeah. So maybe, you know, so much has advanced that some of the stuff that they used, I don't know the world to know how long it takes to build something like this. Is there another one right now in the works that's like the super innovative yeah. one that they're building? Yeah, there's a successor to this one that's being planned called the Habitable Worlds Observatory, HWO. It's not being built yet, but people are starting to plan out what it might look like and come up with designs and things. And uh, this guy will try and take an actual photo of an exoplanet from afar. So instead of flying a spaceship past to take a photo, it's going to try and block out the starlight. So imagine like if you look up at the sun, you put your thumb over the sun, you could actually use that that blocking out of the light yeah. to make it easier to see stars or whatever nearby, it's going to try and basically do the same thing for stars. So try and block out the star, but not block out the planets, which is very, very difficult to do, to do both of those things. A planet is a billion times fainter than a star. A planet is a billion times fainter than a star. Yeah. So that uh, the Earth is. So that, that's a huge... Um, compression factor that you have to remove starlight. Got it. It's very, very difficult. And the launch date for this is 2040. By the way, so yeah. when we're talking about, so we're talking about 16 years from now, when we're talking about the Proxima Centauri B, right? Is there any technology right now for us, even with the one you were talking about, the telescope or the new one that they're coming out with, where you're going to be able to look at it and say, what is there? That's a lake. That's an ocean. That's a mountain. Is there anything mm. like that that'll be here by 2040? Not unless we do something radical. So, the, I, you know, there are some interesting ideas. So one crazy idea, which maybe you'll like, is the idea of turning the sun into a telescope. And I've certainly proposed an, a similar idea of turning the Earth into a telescope. I'll tell you the sun one first. So this is, the sun is a gravitational mass, and so all gravitational masses bend light. So actually, you know, if you go all the way back to, I think, 1929, Arthur Eddington, who won the Nobel Prize, I believe, for this, showed that for the first time during a uh, total eclipse. He, he took a photo of a star that was close by to the sun, and then he took the same photo of the star at a different time, and you notice it shifted position because the sun, when things are close to the sun, the sun's gravity bends light into a curve around them. So gravity bends stuff. Now, anything that bends light is a lens. So just the same way, you know, if you're wearing glasses, glasses yeah. or a magnifying glass, yeah. it's just bending light. Sure. So the sun can be a lens. You just, have, you just have to find the focus point. Now, the focus point ends up being way beyond the orbit of Pluto. So this is in the very outskirts of the solar system. But in principle, if we flew out there 500, 600 times further away from the sun than the Earth orbits the sun, so really far out there, there is a point which is a focus point, and that's a gravitational lens where we could pull a telescope and it would effectively collect the entire power of the sun in terms of the amount of light it could receive. Now, that thing could resolve kilometer scale, rivers, lakes, mountains, that kind of stuff on the surface. That's of the what we need. I mean, yeah. I, we need to see what's out there, right? Yeah. So this is a, 
an interesting proposal. It's very difficult to fly that far away from the Earth and have infrastructure. It's just kind of a little bit sci-fi at this point to have significant space infrastructure that far out from the sun. The furthest thing we have is like Voyager 2, which is now basically dilapidated. It's falling apart. We can barely hold on to simple transmission with it. It has these magnetic tapes which are falling apart on it. Its batteries are running out. So, you know, it's very difficult to have stuff out there, but that would be the ultimate telescope. And so I think... If there are aliens out there, that would be the telescope they would build. Because you can't build a better telescope than an entire star. Can that happen during our lifetime? It it would take an enormous investment. What's what's enormous? I think you'd be looking at, you know, Apollo era levels of funding for this for this single objective. Um, So you're probably talking about, you know, maybe two hundred billion dollars, something like that. So so what? I mean, two hundred billion dollars is. What, what what is worth to us? Uh, Apollo was what twenty five point eight billion in nineteen sixty, right? Between nineteen sixty and seventy three, oh, approximately two hundred fifty seven billion when adjusted to inflation. I got you. Okay, yeah. so two hundred two hundred fifty billion dollars to do this. The question then becomes: If you put all the countries together, the top ones, top twenty, powerful, mm-hmm. U.S., China, Russia, you know, you take France, Germany, all the guys that have money, India. And you say, hey, guys, collectively, let's do this. Yeah. What is it worth for us to know if there's civilization out there? Yeah, it's, it's hard to, like, answer the question, what is the value of blue sky research sometimes? I know people ask that a lot. What is the value of NASA? But, look, here's the thing. Every dollar that we've put into NASA, on average, returns to the economy. Its estimates vary, but between 7 and $14 how do per you, dollar. How do they measure that? By looking at the the patents, the you know the material development, I think you look at like medicine, materials, communications, environmental monitoring, um, and even tech consumer products. You, you know what that does to me, Rob? Here's what it makes me think about. Do you know who AOC is in America? Yeah. Okay. AOC wants us to put thirty thirty trillion dollars with Bernie Sanders. Tap in tap in climate change thirty trillion dollars. Okay. Now, if if you put climate change thirty trillion dollars. Right. That is their plan. Zoom in a little bit so I can read it. Overall, global damage uh, are estimated to be thirty eight trillion dollars with a likely range of 15 to 39, 59, uh, 19 mm-hmm. to fifty nine trillion dollars. Right. But I'm talking about the, uh, the green uh, uh, deal, uh, green deal. Yeah, just put that in there. Uh, let's see what comes up. So the plan was it was going to cost us the U.S. thirty trillion dollars. Can you find that, Rob? Somewhere just happened. AOC climate change, thirty trillion dollars. So, this whole thing that was proposed with thirty trillion dollars, just control F thirty to see if you find it or not. Okay, maybe I'm gonna have to find it wrong. But this whole thing with thirty trillion dollars that was proposed to us for climate change. Hmm. Okay, there is no promises like what it's going to do. There wasn't like you know, here's what we need to do. Here's what we're gonna get. This is what it's going to come with it, right? There was nothing like that. It was a lot of, you know, wishy-washy promises of what it is. But if you sat there, and I'm telling you, you told the taxpayers, hey, guys, let me tell you what we're going to do. Would you like to know once and for all if there is civilization out there? In these uncertain times, if there's anything we need is we need people to believe the future looks bright. So you, if you've heard about me saying this mission to you, we're on a mission to get a million people to wear this gear. And this is why we're doing it. If you buy one of these hats, there's a category of buying one hat, getting the second one free. If you haven't yet worn this gear publicly, go ahead and test it out. Buy some of the gear, wear it in public, and see how many people will stop by and say, you're also, you also watch a value team? You, you also follow PBD Podcast? I do too. Place your order. Go to vtmerch.com. Click on the link above or below. Place your order and represent the VT and the PBD Podcast gear. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.